Hello, this is Melinda Eshelman from the University of Kentucky Department of Anesthesiology, and I'm going to be talking to you today about diabetes. Um, so a large number of Americans have diabetes. There's 29 million that have a diagnosis of diabetes, which accounts for 7% of the population, and then another 40 million that have pre-diabetes. And so this is about another 10% of the population. So about 17% have either a diagnosis of diabetes or pre-diabetes, so they have some insulin resistance or some hyperglycemia. Um, not all of our patients have a that have hyperglycemia do have diabetes or have a diagnosis of diabetes. So 41% um, of critically ill patients that present with acute coronary syndrome have hyperglycemia. 80% of patients after cardiac surgery will have hyperglycemia. And then 80% of patients in the ICU that don't have a diagnosis of diabetes um, will have hyperglycemia. So this is something that we will be um, dealing with both in the operative room and in, in the ICU afterwards. So for a diagnosis of diabetes, the First of all, the normal blood glucose is less than 100. Pre-diabetes is defined as a glucose between 100 and 125, or a hemoglobin A1C between 5.7 and 6.4%. A diagnosis of diabetes occurs if your glucose is greater than 126 on two separate occasions, or if your hemoglobin A1C is greater than 6.5%. So that hemoglobin A1C, as you all know, is an indication of what the blood glucose has been for approximately the last 90 days. Um, and on the left is a chart from bearish that shows um, the correlation between um, blood glucose levels and your hemoglobin A1C. So if your hemoglobin A1C um, is 10, then your average blood glucose is usually around 180. Um, so obviously not very well controlled. And the higher that hemoglobin A1C goes, the more poorly controlled your diabetes is. So when we think of diabetes, we most often think of type 1 and type 2 diabetes, which I'll go into in just a second. There's also gestational diabetes, which occurs during the second or third trimester of pregnancy. Not going to talk about that too much, but it can um, indicate that perhaps the patient will develop uh, diabetes later. Not necessarily 100%, but um, it increases the risk that the patient will go on to develop diabetes. There's also diabetes due to other causes, so chronic pancreatitis, pancreatic surgery, cystic fibrosis, um, hemochromatosis. So anything that is going to destroy that, the pancreas and destroy, destroy the insulin secreting cells can also lead to diabetes. So type 1 diabetes is due to T-cell mediated autoimmune destruction of the pancreatic beta cells, and those beta cells are what secretes um, insulin. The exact cause is unknown. There are some theories about it. Um, it's thought certain environmental triggers in genetically susceptible hosts can lead to the development of diabetes, specifically um, enteroviruses, dietary proteins, different drugs or chemicals. Again, only in someone that is genetically susceptible, um, but it's kind of hard to predict exactly who that person will be. Um, type 1 diabetes accounts for 5 to 10 percent total of the, of the cases of diabetes, and most patients present early in life, usually less than 40, although we typically think of it as in pediatric patients, um, people can present uh, later in life than, than as children. These patients present with fatigue, weight loss, polyuria, polydipsia. They you know, will be frequently urinating and just won't always be thirsty and not seem to be able to drink enough water. They can have blurred vision because of the hyperglycemia. And then they are um, intravascularly depleted because of all of the hyperglycemia. There is a, a lot of uh, glucose that ends up in the urine. And so there's an osmotic diuresis that happens. And so these patients, they're very, very, in, can present very, very intravascularly dry. Before hyperglycemia happens, 80 to 90 percent of the beta cell function has to be lost. So these patients have been losing beta cells for a while, but it isn't until 80 to 90 percent of these beta cells are lost that this patient will present with hyperglycemia and you'll start seeing signs and symptoms of um, hyperglycemia. Because, again, these beta cells are destroyed, there is no production of insulin. So type 1 diabetes cannot be controlled with diet or oral hypoglycemic agents like type 2 diabetes could be controlled with. So type 1 diabetes requires insulin for treatment. And these patients are more likely to become ketotic and sustain progressive end orbit complications. And it tends to be more difficult to control the blood sugar in patients with type 1 diabetes than it is in other um, types of diabetes. So 90% of cases of diabetes are due to type 2 diabetes. This has a more gradual onset, usually later in life, although more and more we're seeing the diagnosis of type 2 diabetes in teenagers and adolescents due to the obesity epidemic. And in fact, 85% of kids that 
that are diagnosed with type 2 diabetes are overweight and or obese at the time of diagnosis. And this is a problem, this type 2 diabetes, it's not going away. Um, between 20, 2000 and 2025, uh, it's predicted that the number of patients with type 2 diabetes is going to double. So um, this is something that is here to stay and something that we'll see much more frequently than we will the type 1 diabetics. This type 2 diabetes is due to relative beta cell insufficiency and insulin resistance. So kind of a combination. It starts out with the peripheral tissue being insensitive to insulin. And so the pancreas secretes more and more insulin. And eventually um, the, pancreas, the pancreas and the, the beta cells can't keep up. And so you get pancreatic cell dis dysfunction and the function of those pancreatic cells decreases. And so you're unable to sustain the required amount of insulin in order to compensate for the, the glucose level. And so this is when you start, um, this is later in the disease. So there's three things that sort of happen in type 2 diabetes. You have a, an increased rate of hepatic glucose release, and you have an impaired basal and stimulated insulin secretion, and then you have inefficient use of glucose by peripheral tissues. So this um, insulin resistance may be inherited. Some people may be more susceptible to uh, inefficient use of glucose, um, but then you add obesity and a sedentary lifestyle on top of it, and you uh, end up with the development being of diabetes. Compared to type 1 diabetics, type 2 diabetics are much more resistant to ketosis because they can um, and do secrete some insulin usually, and so they're more resistant to ketosis than are the type 1 diabetics. And the blood sugar tends to be um, easier to control than in, in type 1 diabetes, generally. The physiology of insulin. So the basal rate of insulin secretion by the beta cells of the pancreas is about one unit per hour. This can increase to about five to 10 units per hour, so five to 10 fold after eating, um, giving a total release from the pancreas of about 40 to 50 units per day of insulin. The half-life of insulin is about five minutes. However, clinically, the half-life is significantly longer than that, and this is due to delays in binding and release from different cellular receptors. Insulin is metabolized by both the liver and the kidneys. So when you have severe liver dysfunction, a couple things can lead to hypoglycemia. One, you have the loss of gluconeogenesis. So you are no longer able to um, make glucose when you're having episodes of hypoglycemia. Secondly, because insulin is metabolized by the liver, you have a delayed metabolism of the insulin. So the, ins the duration of action of the insulin is significantly longer, which also increases your risk of hypoglycemia. In renal disease, um, again, because insulin is metabolized by the kidneys, the duration of action of the insulin is prolonged um, because of that renal metabolism. So the metabolic functions of insulin, there are both metabolic and non-metabolic functions of insulin. I'm not going to focus on the non-metabolic uh, functions of insulin right now. I'm only going to focus on the metabolic functions. Um, a few of the metabolic functions are, one, the stimulation of cellular uptake of glucose, specifically in skeletal muscle, adipose tissues, and cardiac cells are dependent on insulin for the uptake of glucose. There are some cells that are not dependent on insulin for the uptake of glucose. These are going to be found in the brain, liver, and immune cells. And this is going to be important because regardless of your insulin status, your brain, liver, and immune cells are all going to be able to take up glucose regardless of insulin. But insulin does help in the storage of glucose within skeletal muscle, adipose tissue, and cardiac cells. Insulin also leads to the formation of glycogen in order to save glucose stores for later use. And it also suppresses gluconeogenesis and lipolysis. And this makes sense because gluconeogenesis is when you're going to need to make glucose because your glucose levels are too low. And then lip the function of lipolysis is also going to be breaking down lipids in order to create glucose and if you're secreting insulin, it's likely because your glucose levels are appropriate, and so the secretion of insulin is going to suppress both the gluconeogenesis and the lipolysis. In a diabetic patients, you might have an absence of glycogen because of a relative absence or decreased sensitivity to glucose, and so protein has to be broken down in order to make glucose. Additionally, you'll have abnormal fat metabolism. You'll be using lipids in order to make glucose uh, in hypoglycemic states, and this is going to increase the formation of ketone bodies. And this is something that you'll especially see in type 1 diabetics when they present in diabetic ketoacidosis.
So how do we treat diabetes? So for type 1 diabetes, the only option is insulin. Um, if anyone's a Lord of the Rings fan, um, this is a meme that stems from that. I cannot take credit for it, but um, a type 1 diabetic does not simply stop needing insulin. Type 1 diabetic has no way of making their own insulin, so the treatment for type 1 diabetes is going to be insulin. I am not an endocrinologist, so I am not about to go into the specifics of, of how exactly to dose your insulin, but the treatment of type 1 diabetes is going to rely completely and 100% on insulin. So the treatment of type 2 diabetes, you have a few more options, at least at the beginning, than you do in type 1 diabetes. So you can start with lifestyle modifications. This is going to include dietary adjustments, um, weight loss, and exercise. So exercise is going to increase the sensitivity of your cells to insulin, and uh, a weight loss of, of 10 to 15 percent of your body weight has actually shown to reverse diabetes in some patients, and this is thought to be due to the decreased amount of fat in both the liver and the pancreas in these patients. For patients um, that are either unwilling to um, make these modifications or have tried these modifications and they have not worked, um, the, the second option, there are several oral anti-diabetic drugs, um, oral hypoglycemics that you get to before you get to insulin with the treatment of type 2 diabetes. So there are four main types of oral antidiabetics that type 2 diabetics can take. The first category is going to be your secretagogues, and this is going to be your glyburide, your glipizide, glimepiride. And these stimulate insulin secretion. So these stimulate the beta cells to release more insulin. These cannot be used indefinitely because eventually the beta cells will kind of run out of steam because you've overstimulated them and you will be unable to produce the amount of insulin that's needed. But these could be a good drug of choice for patients that are early on in their diagnosis of diabetes. And again, this um, increases the availability of insulin because it increases and stimulates the insulin secretion. Um, biguanides are uh, the second class of oral antidiabetics, and this includes metformin. These suppress excessive hepatic glucose release, so it de they decrease hepatic gluconeogenesis, and they also enhance um, the utilization of glucose by the skeletal muscle and the adipose tissue. They have additional um, benefits that they can decrease your triglycerides and your LDL. Um, so these can be a really um, great choice in patients that have some sort of metabolic syndrome picture um, where they have elevated triglycerides and elevated LDL. So the metformin can help decrease your triglycerides and LDL, as well as decrease your um, glucose by decreasing the hepatogluconeogenesis. These have a lower risk of hypoglycemia than do the secretagogues because the secretagogues um, increase the amount of insulin that's secreted um, versus the biguanides, which uh, just decrease the um, hepatic gluconeogenesis. So instead of like hammering the cells with more insulin and being like, take all this glucose intercellularly, these are just like, let's take a different approach, and they decrease the hepatic gluconeogenesis. So you have a little bit of a lower risk of hypoglycemia than in the secretagogues. Um, you do have a risk of lactic acidosis. This is why we oftentimes have our patients stop their metformin um, 12 to 24 hours preoperatively. Um, this can be especially um, a risk factor in patients that have renal insufficiency, but this is less common with metformin than with previous generations of biguanides. Then you do have your glutazones or thiazolidine diodes. Um, so this is your pioglitazone and your rosaglitazone, and so these improve your insulin sensitivity of the tissue. So um, it can increase the tissue sensitivity to insulin. And so with a smaller amount of insulin, you can have um, a greater effect. And this also may um, actually work on a genetic level to help um, encoding proteins for glucose and lipid metabolism, as well as endothelial function and athero, uh, atherogenesis. Um, but these can, again, the glitazones improve your insulin sensitivity. So they act on a tissue level to improve the tissue sensitivity to insulin. And then you have your alpha glu glucosidase inhibitors. Um, so these are going to delay your gastrointestinal absorption of glucose. And so this works at the brush border of the enterocytes in the small intestine, and it results in a delay of 
um, absorption of glucose. So there, again, there's four different ways. One, you can increase your insulin secretion, which is your creative bags. Two, you can decrease the amount of glucose that's released by the liver with your bigonides. Three, with your glutazones, you can improve the tissue sensitivity to insulin. And then four, with your alpha, alpha glucosidase inhibitors, you can delay your gastrointestinal absorption of glucose. So through a combination of these medications, um, you can help control your glucose level before you get to the point of needing insulin. End organ complications of diabetes. Um, pretty widespread atherosclerosis can occur. This isn't limited to any particular arteries. It's any artery can develop atherosclerosis. So you can see coronary disease, peripheral vascular disease, cerebral vascular disease, renal vascular disease. Um, and especially in patients with type 1 diabetes, you can see coronary artery disease at a much younger age than you would um, expect to see. Unsurprisingly, this leads to an increased incidence of post-op MI, and you can see a cardiomyopathy in the setting of a normal coronary catheterization. So you would expect if you had um, arterial blockages, they would show up on a, on a coronary cath, but the thought is that some of the very small vessels might be affected by diabetes, and these small vessels might not be visualized on coronary cath. So you can have uh, myocardial ischemia with a normal coronary cath in, in the setting of diabetes. 20 to 40 percent of diabetics will develop some sort of nephropathy. This is the leading cause of end-stage renal disease currently. Um, first, before you see an increase in creatinine or a decrease in GFR, you'll actually see a little bit of leaking of albumin in the urine. So you'll see albuminuria before you see um, a decrease in renal function. There's also several different types of neuropathies that can be seen, both sensory neuropathies, autonomic neuropathies, and I'm going to talk about more about those in just a second. Like I said, there's a few different neuropathies that can be seen with diabetes. I know we frequently think of sensory neuropathy with those um, little tests that they do to test the sensation of the feet. And we oftentimes see patients in the operating room that have had, you know, diabetic foot wounds that they haven't been able to feel. Um, you know, I've seen patients with pretty significant burns on their feet because their feet were too close to the fire and they didn't realize that they were burning because they have um, a sensory neuropathy. But you can also see autonomic neuropathies. Um, and these can be a little bit uh, these can be dangerous for the patient. So signs of uh, cardiovascular autonomic neuropathy is going to be um, resting tachycardia, exercise intolerance, and orthostatic hypotension. If you have a patient that has an autonomic neuropathy, this can um, create more problems for you intraoperatively. It can predispose you to or predispose the patient to intraoperative hypothermia. It can um, put the patient at a higher risk for intraoperative hypotension um, that requires a continuous vasopressor infusion and also increase the risk for perioperative cardiorespiratory arrest. Um, additionally, with tracheal intubation, there might be an exaggerated response. So uh, more hypertension than you'd expect with direct laryngoscopy. And all of these things can be a result of this cardiovascular autonomic neuropathy and are really a sign of how serious and how severe this patient's diabetes is. Again, I think the biggest risk for this is going to be that if you have this cardiovascular autonomic neuropathy, it increases the risk for um, perioperative perioperative cardio, um, cardiorespiratory arrest, which is obviously something that we um, do not want to happen. We are, we are trying to avoid. Um, you can also see um, gastrointestinal neuropathies. And so this um, we think of frequently gastroparesis, constipation, constipation or diarrhea. We think of delayed gastric emptying. And so this can increase the risk um, that a patient will have an aspiration event on induction. If they have, um, you know, delayed ga gastric emptying and gastroparesis, they can have these large volumes in their stomach that um, may cause problems when you try to positive pressure ventilate or, or um, induce the patient. DM and DL. So diabetes can lead to difficulty with direct laryngoscopy. Um, this is due to diabetic stiff joint syndrome. And so um, this leads to decreased mobility of many joints, but specifically the one that concerns us is the allanto-occipital joint. And so this makes it difficult um, to perform direct laryngoscopy or can make it difficult to perform direct laryngoscopy on patients with diabetes. This is seen more frequently in patients with type 1 diabetes and is due to non-enzymatic glycosylation of collagen and then deposition of this collagen within the joints. And again, the joint that we're concerned about is the allanto-occipital joint. But this diabetic stiff joint syndrome can lead to difficulty with direct laryngoscopy and can lead to a difficult airway in a patient with um, diabetes. 
So, so much so that uh, 40% of juvenile patients with diabetes that were presenting for a kidney transplant actually had um, difficult direct laryngoscopy. So again, you have to figure that these patients, you know, their type one diabetes is, is so bad and so difficult to control that it's led to end stage renal disease requiring a renal transplant. And so it's, it's not every patient, you know, it's, it's a subset of patients that you're looking at, but just something to be um, thinking of when you ask patients to um, flex and extend their neck and do the airway exam if they have a history of diabetes, that um, there is a distinct possibility that they may be a little bit more different, difficult um, to perform direct laryngoscopy on than, than you might initially think. So preoperative evaluation of patients with diabetes. Um, you have to have a high index of suspicion for myocardial ischemia. These patients can have silent MIs and be having silent ischemia and be unaware of it. Um, especially if uh, autonomic neuropathy is present. And so if you can't determine their functional status or you can't determine their exercise tolerance, uh, having some stress tests or some cardiovascular testing preoperatively um, might be a good idea. These patients also, again, have renal disease frequently. So 20 to 40 percent of patients with diabetes have, have renal disease, and it's the leading cause, cause of end-stage renal disease in the U.S. And so um, do the things that you would normally do. So control um, their blood pressure, avoid hypotension, preserve your renal blood flow, and avoid nephrotoxins, and maintain their hydration status. Autonomic neuropathy, so this predisposes to dysrhythmias and intraoperative hypotension, specifically hypotension that will require a, a vasopressor infusion of some sort. Um, and again, if they do have this autonomic autonomic neuropathy, they can be having silent uh, myocardial ischemia, and so just something to consider. Diabetic stiff joint syndrome we discussed um, due to non-enzymatic uh, glycosylation of proteins um, and deposition of these proteins within the, the collagen in the joint space. Specifically, the joint that we're worrying about is the allanto-occipital joint, um, so they can have a reduced neck mobility. And then uh, diabetic gastroparesis. If they have reduced gastric emptying, they may have a higher risk of aspiration on induction, even if their NPO status is appropriate. Um, preoperatively, so they're it, on inpatients on insulin. Um, you know, every hospital has kind of the protocol or, or what they tell their patients to do with their uh, long-acting insulin, and so um, usually it involves a, a slightly decreased dose of insulin the night before, and then maybe half the dose of NPH in the morning and, and hold anything short acting um, to in order to avoid uh, hypoglycemia in these patients that are going to be NPO. Oral hypoglycemics, uh, it's recommended that they are held for 24 to 48 hours preoperatively. Um, and then sulfonylureas, this is they should be avoided during the entire uh, perioperative period because they can um, block this uh, myocardial potassium ATP channel that is responsible for ischemia and then anesthetic-induced preconditioning. And so anesthetic-induced preconditioning can actually help uh, prepare the heart for uh, small ischemic events and, and help the heart and the myocardial tissue deal with these ischemic events better. So these sulfonylurea should probably be avoided during the entire perioperative period. So intraoperative management of diabetes includes aggressive glycemic control, which is defined as between 120 and 180. Um, when you tighten that range a little bit more, you have more episodes of hypoglycemia, which can is arguably worse than hyperglycemia. And so um, the guidelines were relaxed a little bit to 120 to 180. You do want to keep that sugar less than 200 because if your glucose ends up above 200, this can cause glycosuria, um, dehydration, and, and inhibit wound healing. Consider a continuous infusion of insulin. Um, it might not be necessary if you don't have a very long case or aren't anticipating being in the operating room very long, but if you do have a longer case, this can um, help greatly and make it a little bit easier on you as a provider to maintain glucose levels. Some cases might have higher insulin requirements than other cases, specifically patients undergoing a cabbage. I know um, our cardioplegia solution has a fair amount of glucose in it, and so the more cardioplegia you give, the more glucose you give, and the higher the sugar goes, and so the higher the insulin requirements are. So um, patients undergoing cabbage, patients that are on steroids, this is going to cause hyperglycemia, that have severe infections um, on TPN of some sort, or patients with vasopressin vasopressor infusions, all of these patients can have higher insulin requirements. And again, um, you are going to want to avoid hyperglycemia, but obviously you also want to avoid hypoglycemia. Some of the um, signs and symptoms 
of hypoglycemia may be difficult to recognize under general anesthesia, and this can be both due to our medications or in patients that have autonomic neuropathy. Um, so if you do find that you have a, a patient that develops hypoglycemia, first of all, you might only know about this if you actually check the glucose level, and then second of all, um, an administration of dextrose is indicated. So again, post-operative care is going to focus on monitoring glucose levels and monitoring of insulin requirements. Um, hyperglycemia has been associated with poor outcomes, but the ADA has not defined a specific uh, blood glucose level that sh you should be targeting in this post-operative period. Um, so right now, the recommendation is that in a critically ill patient, the glucose level is maintained between 140 and 180, and this is by the American Diabetes Association. And um, if the glucose is greater than 180, they do recommend that you start um, an insulin, give insulin. They don't really specify whether it's an infusion or a bolus or any sort, but um, once you start getting at the higher end of that 140 to 180, they do recommend that you start administering insulin. Um, that is it about diabetes. Thanks for sticking with me through this presentation. My primary references for this talk were um, Bearish clinical anesthesia, and then Stolting's anesthesia and coexisting disease. Both of these provide a great review of diabetes, and uh, a lot of the material that these books cover was covered in this talk. Um, thanks again, um, and everyone have a great day.